You're listening to Innovators, the podcast from Harris Search Associates, where we speak with global leaders in education, research, engineering, and the health sciences, and ask them to share lessons learned as they continue to advance the frontiers of innovation and discovery. Today's podcast will be led by Rick Skinner, Senior Consultant. Of late, the phrases data science and big data are rivaled in terms of use only by the words iconic and like, as in she has become like iconic. My own appreciation of the term ubiquity came when I visited a child's museum recently and found a book for children entitled Big Data, Information in the Digital World with Science Activities for Kids. So pervasive has data science become that the old joke about the drunk down on hands and knees beneath the streetlight, clearly looking for something, is invoked by skeptics of the field. You likely know the joke. When a passerby asks if something was lost, the drunker responds, yeah, my keys. Well, are you sure this is where you lost them? Passerby inquires. No, replied the drunk, but the light is better here. For skeptics, data science is the light of the street lamp. Given enough digital information about any subject, electronic medical records or mobile phone traffic, for example, and a computer of even just conventional calculating capability, they argue, and you will find something, perhaps a pattern within the data, not heretofore observed. But even skeptics can see that data science's lineage has long roots going back millennia as a direct outgrowth of the earliest attempts to create calculating machines that were usually products of philosophers, especially logicians and mathematicians. Then in the Second World War, the idea of a device capable of performing hundreds of thousands of calculations per second became reality with the construction of electromechanical machines for use in code breaking and the targeting of weapons. By the 1960s, computer science became a distinctive academic discipline in an occupation outside universities and drew students, virtually all of whom in the US were white males in very large numbers. Early on, work focused on the development of computer operating systems to manage the machines and then to analyze digital databases. The advent of the internet and networked and personal computing and the rapid expansion of computer science applications in fields other than mathematics and logic prompted new names such as data processing and management information systems that reflected computer applications in business. The next stage is one for the proverbial chicken and egg question. More and more of every kind of information is digital and therefore machine readable. So because virtually every subject matter is information, Shakespeare's plays, samples of interplanetary soil and rock, varieties of bush beans, has been made digital and can be analyzed in endless ways with a personal computer and then shared with others. As a result, big data came into being and required tools, data science, to help make sense of all that information. Given the plethora of data and access to computing, the field of data science appears to be a very broad name for activities that include the aforementioned big data, as well as informatics, machine learning, and artificial intelligence, to mention just some of the activities subsumed by data science. So it would be a mistake to underestimate the impact of data science in a world flooded by digital information, which is to say all of Earth and beyond, including sounds, images, measurements of all sorts. Indeed, it is that flood of data that makes something akin to data science necessary and potentially invaluable. Now being an early pioneer has its pluses and minuses, but so does the work of the people who come next and proselytize others on the virtues of data science, make sense of what the field is all about, as well as share the kinds of problems and questions it can help answer. And as you well know, the first pioneers are the ones who managed to escape the wrath of indigenous people by hurrying back to familiar territory Whereas the second wave of proponents has to go forth, stay, and find a way to live peaceably. We have with us today on Innovators, two of that second group of data scientists. 
Surprisingly, they both sound and seem to have survived and in fact thrived through the rigors of trying to institutionalize data science in their own organizations, as well as other universities, while reaching out beyond academia. Jing Lu is the managing director of the Michigan Institute for Data Science at the University of Michigan, a post she rose to after serving as the Institute's senior scientist and industry partnership leader. Before those roles, she worked in several in University of Michigan programs and, and centers, and as a research, science, research assistant professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Molecular and Behavioral Neuroscience. Dr. Liu was postdoctoral fellow and research associate in Stanford's Department of Neurobiology. She has a doctorate in biology from Caltech and her undergraduate degree in biophysics and physiology from Peking University. Sarah Stone is the executive director of the University of Washington's eScience Institute, an organization charged with advancing data intensive discovery in all fields. Dr. Stone's undergraduate degree is from the University of California, Santa Cruz, and her doctorate is in geography from the University of California, Santa Barbara. She was a postdoctoral student in the Virginia Institute for Marine Studies. In addition to her role as eScience Institute executive director, Dr. Stone is also co-executive director and co-founder of the University of Washington Data Science for Social Good Program. Welcome to Innovators. I want to start by drawing an imaginary circle. And I want to ask you to put names of activities within that circle, which to your mind are part of the family of data science. And so Dr. Lou, we'll let you start. Sure. Thank you for having me here today. I look forward to some very fun and informative conversation. Thank you also for a great synopsis of how data science came into being. As you mentioned, people have been using data for thousands of years, but that doesn't mean that we're all data scientists. I would like to take the view that data science is a much formal way of dealing with data, especially where, when it's not possible for us to manually arrange data anymore and to inspect data with our bare eyes. So I want to offer the disciplinary perspective about data science activities because the university research landscape is divided by disciplines. So data science cuts across traditional disciplines. It overlaps with many, but it doesn't belong to any one or a few existing disciplines. The existing disciplines together constitute the data science theory, the methodology, and their applications. These are the three things I want to put in a circle. I'll talk a little bit about how they relate to the traditional disciplines. So a small portion of math, statistics, and computer science can be regarded as core data science activities in that they develop theories about the properties of data, especially big data. These theories often also define what we can or cannot do with the data. For example, tensor theories are really important for machine learning, Graph theory for networks and set theories are essential for databases. Then there are methodologies such as machine learning methods, network analysis methods, and so forth that are developed from the theories. There are endless research domains that can use the data science methods like the physical sciences, biomedical sciences, social science, environmental science, law, engineering, you name it. So the majority of research activities in these domains don't involve data science, but a percentage of researchers in all of these domains carry out data science activities. And this percentage will only increase as big data becomes prevalent. So I like to use statistics as an example. I'm a visual neuroscientist by training and my research involved a huge amount of statistics. So I carried out statistics activities even though I am not a statistician. So I think this is worth noting because I'm sure this point will come up later in our conversation as well. Many academic data science institutes have to consider their focus, whether they focus on theory and methodology development or whether on bringing a wide range of disciplines to data science or a bit of both. This is actually not a simple question at all. Dr. Stone, would you mind taking a shot at this? Sure, I'd love to. And I'd like to just join Jing in saying thank you for the invitation to join you today. And it's a delight to be here with both of you. Um, I take a very similar view 
messaging. And I, I, I think that we have really approached data science as a way of doing work. And this way of doing work really as we often would kind of make the joke that when your data has outgrown your spreadsheet. <laughs> um, but I also don't think this is just about big data. In fact, you know, when we early in our institute, we would have researchers come to us and say, well, I don't know if I have big data. So can I do data science with it? And it's not just about, you know, the size of the data. We also think, you know, about complex data, heterogeneous data and bringing different types of data together. All of these things really add to, you know, and, and require the need of complex tools and techniques. And so in, in that regard, we often think about data science, and this is another way that institutes can orient themselves around the, the data science workflow. And most of us think of this as kind of an iterative process, but we're going all the way from, you know, the beginning points of things like data collection, um, identifying the data, if you're using data that already exists, all the way out, you know, through data cleaning and prep, creating the infrastructure, you know, analysis and modeling, it may be out to some distant presentation or publication, maybe for your scientific community, but could also be for community partners. And so when we look at data science institutes popping up at universities across the country, we see that some of these are really focused in a particular area. Like we see a lot of institutes fo focused on AI, for example. I think both of our institutes really took the approach of being interested and engaged in all parts of that data science workflow. So when we work with researchers, we will engage, you know, in data cleaning, <laughs> data munging, you know, which is often you'll hear, hear data scientists, data scientists talk about how that's often 80% of the work is in, in that space. But we're really interested in all aspects of that data science life cycle. And just recognizing that that's often, you know, it often isn't a straight shot. It's a very iterative process um, as we move through that pipeline. Yeah, and I think I'll, I'll point back to Jing to, to build on that because I know she, she wanted to think about how you then integrate the, the methods and the subject matter expertise. I think my question is, is this more, would the defining feature of data science then be a set of skills more than some subject matter expertise? Uh, my answer is actually uh, somewhat ambiguous because I think this actually is up for interpretation. For me, if I put this in the context of academic data science institutes, I think the two are really hard to tease apart because we need both cutting edge methods and deep subject matter expertise. On the one hand, for data science to advance research in many domains, and on the other hand, for research in these domains to inspire data science methods and theory development. In this sense, it actually, it actually doesn't have any difference between you know, you know, math or statistics and the domains that use math and statistics. So for academic data science institutes though, it's also about the goals and the environment of each institute. Some places like MIDAS and eScience, like Sarah just mentioned, we serve the entire university campus. So a prominent goal is for us to transform a vast number of research domains with data science. But some other data science institutes, like Sarah mentioned, focus on certain types of data science methodology and some institutes sit in statistics or computer science departments. So naturally their focus is different. But I think there isn't a right or wrong choice. It's rather what fits your purpose. Can I just follow up on that one? Because there seems to me there's another, another kind of question I'd like to ask about that. Is there something that binds them all together? The phrase that Sarah just used, the one of it's um, a way of doing work. That's a, I thought that was an interesting phrase because it put it very much in the domain of saying, uh, I, I'm my, whatever my field is, this is the way I'm gonna go about doing this work and that in data science tends to encompass that. Did I capture that right, Sarah? I mean, am I right on that? Yeah, yeah, that, that is how we've characterized it and thought about data science. But I, that I, I would agree with Jing that this is, this is not the accepted <laughs> idea. There's a lot of different notions about data science as a discipline that is separate from other disciplines where we, we've seen it really as an integration that is important for all disciplines. I'm glad you brought up the fact that you both have institutes that are lodged and housed and, and kept safe and warm by universities. 
but at the same time, you're at being asked to reach out, to go beyond the university. And I find, I've noted a number of examples for both of you, where you've gone into communities to help communities do activities. I guess the question that it says to me is, how do you get, how do your institutes get evaluated? Are there some metrics that are used that say, yes, this, this institute is doing what we set it out to do? Uh, do you look at publications? What are the metrics by which you judge an undertaking that is as multi or interdisciplinary as both of yours, but nevertheless housing this way of doing things, data science? Yeah, I can, I can jump in there. And I think a little bit for, for my institute, I'll provide a little bit of institutional history because I think it's sort of relevant. So we were one of the more Sloan data science environments along with UC Berkeley and NYU starting back in 2013. And this was a large investment by the Moore & Sloan Foundations to really create a, both a physical environment as well as of course now we, we only live in virtual environments um, for data science to flourish on university campuses recognizing that this was kind of, you know, a, a unique, you know, you can think of it as a, a new paradigm, a new way of, of thinking and doing, and that there really needed to be unique spaces and unique positions to support data science in academia. I think, you know, from that, along with our mission to serve the entire campus community, we really tried to build out programs that included kind of easy entry points. So anybody who wanted to be involved in the institute, we took the approach, if you feel like you're doing data science, then we think you're doing data science too, and we want you to be part of our community. And that's a really different approach, I think, you know, than other organizations are taking where it's, there's maybe sort of some distinct walls about what is data science and what isn't data science. And then to create a number of different, so if we think about metrics, what we were really trying to do was serve all fields and all researchers who were interested in engaging in data science. And so we're oriented around things like, you know, just drop in office hours, you know, running seminar series to broadly disseminate, engaging with researchers and kind of, you know, quarter long research engagements with the hope that then, you know, they take what they've learned back to their home department and maybe really have the opportunity to transform the way, maybe just their lab is working, maybe the way the department's working to really understand how data science can be integrated into the work that they're doing. And then of course, running a whole lot of different types of training courses. We are very closely partnered with an organization called The Carpentries and running um, introductory programming workshops. Um, we've also pioneered a collaborative, inclusive learning environment called a Hack Week that are done in, for many different disciplines. Um, and so I guess when we think about metrics, we're thinking about how, how are these programs gaining traction? Who's being drawn to these programs? Are they coming from a variety of disciplines? What are the disciplines that we're really not connecting with and how can we do that better? And so I would say arts and humanities is a place where we've had more challenge in terms of making connections. And so that's an area that we're, we're starting to build out and make more connections with. And that's been very intentional. So I think, you know, getting to metrics, it's a lot around who's, who's coming to the table. What's the career distribution of people who are joining us? What disciplines are they coming from? And I think another measurement that we look at, and this goes back to um, kind of the, the more Sloan data science environments in the context of that structure, each of our three universities were trying similar but different things. And so we had the opportunity to see like what worked and what didn't work. And so that, that was very informative. That also then helped us to, to hone in on the things that really would work for our campuses collectively. Um, and to use that as a model to build out. So we had a paper that came out of that that kind of is about how institutions can build data science institutes, what are the core elements. And then I think it also has given us the confidence um, to model programs and to create guide. So we're, for example, for the Hack Weeks, we're putting mm -hmm. together Hack Weeks as a service, as a model, um, and as a service to other organizations. We run a program called Data Science for Social Good and actually Jing's involved in this, we're putting out a roadmap for other organizations. So another way in which we provide a metric is by putting that out into the broader community and looking for adoption of similar types of programs and methodologies. Chuck, I want to ask you, and then I'd like to hear Jing's comment. In both instances, is this a vote with your feet? In other words, somebody shows up at your shop and says, I'm interested in your work. 
that's all it takes, in effect, to get somebody into your institute. Am I right in both cases? Well, I say to become an affiliate, they have to talk to me for a half an hour. So you can decide how high that bar uh, is. But. Okay. <laughs> that's really good. And that's really, as, as Jane will note too, you know, a lot of what we do is provide a network. Um, you know, we help to build networks between departments, which can become very siloed at universities and help researchers connect. And so part of me as an individual in our institute is to help to make those connections. So when, it, when somebody new wants to get involved, I need to understand, you know, where are they coming from? What type of collaborations are they looking for? Are they a methodologist who's looking for an application field to try out a new technique? And, or are they uh, somebody who's deep in a domain field and they're really looking for a data science tool that's been developed by somebody else that they can apply to their research? I can't help but think of an assistant professor in English putting on a mask because he doesn't want any of the senior faculty to know that he's going out over to this place called data science. And he shows up with his mask on and says, could you let me talk to you for 30 minutes? But don't tell anybody else I'm doing it. They would get drummed out of the core. Gene, is just the same way you can you can just vote with your feet and come to Midas? Yes. So we are a pretty inclusive organization as well. We asked faculty members what they have already been doing in the domain of data science and what they would like to gain. We very much have the same philosophy as eScience, which is we meet people where they are in terms of their data needs and in terms of, uh, of their skill levels, and then we support them in ways that make sense to them. So Sarah, interestingly, we are also trying to be very intentional to engage researchers in arts and humanities. Well, I have a, I have a personal story to tell you. Back in 1976, I was a young assistant professor and I started a computer lab for the arts and science, for the arts and humanities. But my first person to walk in to vote to say they'd be part of it was a guy who was a Shakespearean scholar who wanted to show that the placement of, of Shakespearean characters was done by a very elaborate formula. And he said, how do I digitize all of that? I'm still working on that one. So if you came up with an idea for that, let me know. I'd like to talk. He might be, he might be in his hundred year old, but he's still probably working on it. Let me ask a very long-winded question, if I may, because the person I want to talk about never quite made it in academia, but he was always looked upon as a little too flamboyant. He was the Swedish physician and epidemiologist, Hans Rosling. He used time series data and plotted it over a for about 200 countries over about 200 years. His analyses and his way of representing data was so startling for, at the time that people like uh, Fidel Castro, the United Nations and the Gates Foundation asked him to come and advise them. Uh, it, he started because he noted a very strong correlation between wealth and health and then he depicted that relationship on X and Y coordinates for certain countries, and, and you can probably guess the countries and regions of the world, and it had never been depicted, and he gave the animation to it so he could see the size of the various countries in terms of population over time. Now, people who viewed the display, and sometimes they were replete with Hans Rosling swallowing a sword, literally, he was a sword swallow in his spare time, I guess, he would swallow a sword. People would literally gasp at the power of the data to so clearly delineate just how important wealth was to health as measured by child maternity and maternity morbidity. He was also an epidemiologist and that helped a, a whole lot because it, it's really good at looking at change over time. Science always puts a premium on the importance of reporting results in very clear ways. So that, that's not new. But is it too much to say that data science has a certain kind of dependence on the clarity of depicting and communicating results? Let me just remind you, there was a book written by this by Edward Tufte, and it's a classic book. It's, uh, I think the title is The Display of Quantitative Information, which I told my wife one time I was going to one of his seminars, and she said, that has to be the dullest title I've ever heard in my entire life. But when you go to those things and you look at his book and you look at the way he depicts data, 
it's extraordinary. I mean, it just really, the, that old line about a picture tells a thousand words is absolutely true in those cases. So I think one of the things I'm, I'm curious about as data science has emerged, to what extent is there a premium in data science place on being able to represent the results of analysis in very, very compelling ways? And, and let me be clear here. It seems to me that there is a, a way in which they have to be able to involve a set of skills, or, or if you would, a group of people almost. You need a subject, subject matter expert who would simply say, this is why these two relationships ought to have something to do with one another. You need a data analyst to be say, listen, these data for a country dating back 200 years, is, that's probably not the finest measurements in the world a geographer or a demographer who can plot the data to, to make it make sense to a, an audience. And then you need a communications expert with that strong set of skills and experience in, in data graphics in order to depict that relationship the way it is. Is it too much to say that this is the potential for a marriage of science and art? Or, or is clarity, it's just one of those things that's true of all scientific research and data science is just the newest coming? Or is there something about what the promise of data science is? Maybe not the reality, but the promise is that it will provide you with data that is so compelling that it has an effect far beyond what might otherwise be expected. I think this is a fascinating question. The short answer is, I think this kind of clarity should be part and parcel of the presentation of science in any field. However, I think it's particularly important for data science, simply because data science is used everywhere and has a profound impact on our lives in so many ways, and oftentimes in controversial ways as well. Precisely. This, is, this is something that I think a lot of people have been paying attention to. And then you, you see science journalism, for example, the field evolving and advancing so much in the past few decades, and to from talking about the excitement of scientific dis discovery to talking about the potential pitfalls of new, new science and technology. And so presenting to the public in the sort of increasingly more nuanced ways. And I think this is really important for data science as well, because a public will need to understand in nuanced ways what data tell us. Well, so I think the sort of the combination of, or the collaboration of science and arts has a lot of um, interesting potential in this sense. And I think artists have a major role in this space. Some are already very involved. I wanna actually give you a few examples. One is actually a friend of mine, Kat Hartman, who is the director of data strategy and analytics for the city of Detroit. So effectively they are chief data officer. She holds fine arts degrees in visual arts and information design. And through my work with her, I just realized she has such a great intuition about data visualization. And that's a great angle that she provides to combine with people like me who, who are you know, trained strictly in science. Another example I wanna give is that um, this summer actually there, there will be an exhibit that's gonna be open on the University of Michigan campus and by an artist, Stephanie Dinkins. She's one of the artists concerned with the role of science and technology in, this, in society. Mm -hmm. And she has been creating artistic renditions on artificial intelligence in the context of race, gender, and history. Parallel to that, I'm actually working on a, a research project with our uh, university's uh, Museum of Art. We are looking with algorithms to look at faces and their racial and gender features in the entire collection of artworks in our museum. So our point is to use this as an example to illustrate the power and also the issues of AI and provide a very visual way to present to the public the meaning of fair representation in data. I definitely think a lot of a potential is there for science and arts to work together. And I think to accurately present data science, not just the results, but also its implications is just really important for scientists and for the, the public alike. 
Yeah, well, th thank you, Jing. I, I would like to come uh, get to get to be a, a fly on the wall in that <laughs> exhibit that you're talking about or your project. And yeah. Hopefully you're going to share that out also in a form that can be consumed um, more broadly. Uh, so I would, yeah, I would just um, reinforce what Jing said. And I think it, it's interesting to come back to the prevalence now that we see of complex visualizations in journalism. And that really points to, I think, the, the critical need for data literacy for everybody and thinking about how we achieve that. Because thinking about and looking at these types of visualizations critically is, is very important. So that's, that's something that we've built out in terms of the university curriculum. We've built out that type of curriculum so that every student, with the idea that every student is getting some training in how to look at and think about data that's presented to them, um, you know, from a critical perspective. And I, I also just wanted to go back to, because I think you're really right in, in pointing to that data science happens often in these very complex team structures. As we talked about earlier, it's, it's a lot to think of one person becoming very disciplinarily deep um, and also very deep in, in, in all or even one data science methodology, right? That's, that's a lot for a single person to do. So when we look at, at how data science is actually occurring, on university campuses or in industry, we're often looking at these complex teams of people who are doing um, data science. And I think just building out, especially on the project that Jing was mentioning towards the end and, and something that we've certainly learned through the, the Data Science for Social Good program, that when we're looking to, to do kinds of, kind of translational data science and have a social impact, those team members that you described, I think then, then you need to be making sure to add in some other team members. So people who are thinking about things like the ethical implications of the work that's being done and integration of community members to help co-design activities and really push the team to produce products that aren't just relevant to the research community, but are really benefiting the community whose data is being studied. We've seen a number of examples of, of tragic pitfalls in this space where people weren't um, appropriately integrating or thinking about how the products were going to further marginalize um, already marginalized populations. And so I think there's really a benefit in, in, you know, to use data science to, to have this kind of impact. And I think, you know, as you go, just going back to one of the ways we can do that is by making these visualizations that really are, are appealing, but we always need to be, be careful and be using that data in a responsible way. Um, and that's part of also the teams that we build out. And I think, I think we'll get to that later, but by building diverse complex teams, um, then we have the opportunity to produce better products. There's, there's you know, data to support that and also um, to, to use the data in a way that's responsible to the, the community that the data is, being, is coming from. It, you know, it also made me think that both of you need to get to work very quickly on something like eHarmony for all the people who walk into your institutes and they're all walking in with their own individual skills and their own individual strengths and so forth. You need to do an e-harmony, a matchmaking thing that brings the teams together. Because as you say, you, you, the good news is these people are doing this by their own volition. That's the good news. The bad news is how will they know that there are other people who are doing work where there could be a convergence so that the art and science could actually happen. So I'm looking for, a, I guess we'll call it a de-harmony that you, you're going to guys are going to develop very soon. All right, I won't hold you to that. Indeed, it's a large part of the work that we do. I had a feeling matchmaking was a lot of what you spend your time on. And the cups of coffee are probably voluminous. You come from different fields, albeit you're both in the sciences. And, and each of you came to your post from a career in academia. What other attributes other than those experiences, what other attributes, experiences, skills, does a director need to do the job you're doing? Because it sounds to me like what we're heading toward is a time in which data science centers, institutes are going to become prevalent, that that will likely come about maybe as an interim measure before it takes on its own institutional role or whatever. But what are the things people like you have to be able to do to be successful? I think one of the things that both Jing and I bring with our research backgrounds, as you mentioned, is We've been there. We've, we've had these, these complex data problems and we've struggled. 
And so we can relate when researchers come to us and they're talking about what they're going through. Um, we understand the research life cycle and um, we understand the struggles that people experience and how challenging it can be, particularly if you're maybe in a department where there isn't a lot of data science expertise and you feel like you're really struggling to know where to go or to even find the right resources. So it can be a huge relief just to even know that there is a community on campus that can help you <laughs> and that you can work with. And that doesn't, so I, I think, again, that our, the research experience really does help. And I think it also helps us to understand how to play in the academic space, the academic environment, as I think we all know, is kind of a unique, <laughs> a unique place. And having a sense of how to level the playing field between diverse different you know diverse types of partners and diverse disciplines that come at data science from very different perspectives um, you know i think statisticians coming to data science think of data science very differently than um, astronomers coming in and, and using data science tools and techniques and so having a sense and just a recognition of that that when you're bringing people together trying to create a place where it feels like the voices are are all being heard Part of that, I really think, for our institute, was being seen as a neutral entity on campus, and so not being, you know, not being housed in computer science or really in, in any methodological, you know, mm -hmm. department. Um, that makes it much more likely that you're going to have people coming from the social sciences and the arts and humanities, feeling like that this is a place where everybody gets a voice. They're not being pulled by a particular department or those the needs of that that individual college, maybe even. Uh, so I think that structure is really important. I think the qualities that Sarah mentioned are essential, and I want to elaborate a little bit on uh, what she just said about understanding the culture of the academic research environment, the mindset of the faculty members and the university leadership, the grassroots culture in a sense the distributed ways of how faculty decide their research directions. Then on the other hand, there are oftentimes campus-wide initiatives that push for research in certain directions. The, you know, the relationships between different faculty groups, between departments, between schools, and also the demands in academia. We, we mentioned earlier in you know, the metrics sort of for our institutes, one you know, major metrics for us and for eScience, I'm sure, is how much you're contributing for your faculty members to get external grants. And also how much effort you put in, what you know, the data science institutes put in ourselves to lead grants such as training grants, infrastructure grants, or research consortium grants and so forth. So having an understanding of the culture and the expectation both from the faculty and from the leadership, I think is critical. Another point I wanna make though, is I think what Sarah said about bringing disciplines together, bringing, uh, and you said about bringing, you know, researchers together. Another thing is to bring diverse stakeholders together, academia, industry, government, nonprofits, community organizations. And so I think bringing these stakeholders together and bringing disciplines together requires a lot of creativity. The word creativity is not necessarily associated often with university administrators. <laughs> but we, we, I think we agree that we're still really at the trailblazing stage, building academic data science programs. Sarah and I, we know many of our peers who are doing this kind of work at universities. And I think one quality that stands out is that we, we really are builders. You know, so I, and I think on the one hand, there's no formula to follow. Every data science institute looks very different. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, there is tremendous potential for academic data science. So I think the ability for people to see significant opportunities at a place where many others see nothing will be a huge advantage. I want to touch on the stakeholders part, the diverse stakeholders, because that, that does strike me as calling upon a particular kind of quality of a person. It's one thing to navigate the waters of academia. That, that in itself is no small feat. But to then bring community members, business industry in, and find a way for them to actually collectively learn strikes me as something that is especially, I must say, I, I, I know very few people in most universities who can do that. 
I just don't know many people in a university who could do that. And yet I must say that the, the track record of bringing someone who's non-academic into an academic setting and saying to them, get this institute up and running, it's not good. It's not a strong record. It, 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 it just seems to not work as well. I, if I may, could I press both of you on this point? You used words like creativity, builders and the like. This is somebody who takes initiative. Is that fair to say? This is someone who may respond to someone saying, I want to do this, but also knows how to get initiatives and give them life so that there are people who can cling to them. But just as importantly, somebody has to be able to explain that to a group for whom academia is just another, is the world apart. It, it's not something they're going to understand. So it does take a kind of empathetic imagination, understanding, it seems to me, to work with the kind of diversity you're talking about. It, I love the idea of the, the empathetic understanding, <laughs> the idea that takes that. I think that's really true. Um, and when we work with diverse stakeholders or across sectors, it's really important to understand the incentives um, because the incentives for people working in government and what they're trying to get out of a relationship with the university and the way that they're rewarded and their positions is very different than the reward structure we have within the university. Um, and same, you know, of course, for industry and nonprofits. And so, you know, a lot of, I think, figuring out how that partnership is really going to work is aligning those incentives, but recognizing that, you know, th those incentives are still not going to be the same. It's not suddenly going to be important for somebody in a nonprofit to publish in science. Uh, I mean, it might be a nice <laughs> little side note. And so figuring out how, where are the areas where you can really come together and what are the products that may be specific and, and you know, for research, you know, the, the researchers will get a publication out of it and the, you know, the nonprofit partner um, will get this new tool that they can implement. But where are the pieces that come together and just being really open and transparent about those incentives and having those conversations up front in the process and when you're building the partnership. And I think that does take a lot of finesse and a lot of sensitivity. And again, I, I also think it often comes back to this leveling the playing field and having people on your team who are very good at, at almost serving as translators between these different sectors to help align the goals of a project. Can I make also another observation? I'm aware of some work being done in Washington now that is increasingly federal agencies contract out a lot of their research activity, even more so than in the past partly because they don't have the people to do the work. But one of the things they're doing now increasingly is building in not only an assessment component, that is what you did, the work you research you did, but a communications component that is now being tacked on, not just to NSF, but to NIH groups. They're asking, how are you going to communicate this and get this information out? There's no shortage of information. So you better come up with a way. I'll just use an example. There's an organization in Washington, D.C. called Child Trends that does social science research on the development and well-being of children. They have been really in the forefront of doing some extraordinary things in terms of how they communicate what their research is about so that it can reach audiences beyond social scientists in this case. So what I hear you saying is, it is also a case where a director such as the two of you, you're husbanding along a, a, a multi-stakeholder group you may be the one who needs to say, how are you gonna communicate this? Because I, I must say to you now, the competition for federal funding and federal grants is so intense now that the inability to indicate or to convince that you can communicate this is a pretty serious shortcoming. So you've gotta be able to do that. So I think it is a very important point. You know, bringing multiple uh, stakeholders together, communication, speaking the same language, understanding each other's pain point. I think these are essential. Without these, it, it's, you can't build collaboration. From the academic point of view, I think the data science institutes, a lot of them are understanding this, understanding the importance of a broad alliance, so to speak. And I think uh, you're right that this kind of people traditionally probably weren't uh, particularly sought out or nurtured in an academic environment. But I think the culture is changing. Well, I think you're spot on. I think that's going to be critical. I need to hold your feet to the fire on a, on a subject that's very sensitive to us. 
as a search firm, we are very much committed to pursuing candidates who add to the diversity of the pools of candidates for the jobs, but not just the pools, because that's can be done, but the people who actually get selected. And we know that people in academia are very much aware of the legal and moral reasons for working to achieve a diversity, but they're also part of a profession in which merit counts probably more than anything else that, that a candidate would bring to a position. As a result, sometimes the opportunity to hire a well-qualified person from an underrepresented group is missed because another candidate has somewhat stronger credentials. And the justification is, well, we hired on merit. Now, I find it ironic I'm talking to two women, one of whom is from China. So in this case, I, I'd like to see if I could get an award for diversity because I, well, because when I look through the list of people in most of these fields in data science, I must tell you, they look a lot alike what 40 years ago were the computer science, white males. So my question for you is, I have no doubts of your commitment and the like. What can be done to change now, to change the challenge, to change the difficulty of having a diverse workforce in these fields of data science? If they're that important, it's all the more important to be diverse. What do we need to be doing? What can you do? Let me let me start this, but honestly, I think this is a really tough question. I also don't think the data science institutes can solve this problem by ourselves. I think this is very much a common issue in academia. But let me give you my two cents here, short term and long term. Short term, honestly, I think when you think about diversity, by the time you need to hire somebody, I think there will only be very limited things you can do. So for example, can our leadership provide funding for us to um, increase the diversity of the applicant pool? For example, advertise to minority professional organizations, minority serving institutions, and so forth. How can we leverage the uh, diversity efforts on campus, such as diversity offices, to help us with our recruitment effort instead of letting us come up with our own strategy? Mm -hmm. But I think this is the short-term solution. The long-term so solution is really, I think everybody needs to spend the effort and spend the resource to build an inclusive and diverse workforce and a pipeline for it to start with. So one thing that data science institutes like Midas and eScience have been doing to a certain, you know, to a certain extent is to promote data science education among underrepresented students at the level of uh, undergraduate students or even high school students. Mm -hmm. So I also wanna give you an example, which is our data science consortium, which is an annual event to bring together advanced students and postdocs in data science from peer universities. And we let the university nominate their students and we bring them to University of Michigan, give them a platform for them to share their research and build a network. So interestingly, we had a little bit of success there. In the letter to peer universities to ask for nominations, we stated just with one sentence that we're very interested in building a diverse consortium in the sense of gender, race, socioeconomic status, and so forth. And so far, the majority of the attendees nominated by their universities are women and underrepresented minorities. It's just one sentence to help people to remind them, you know, to set, to get into the mindset of diversity and inclusion. And so I think another thing is how much are we connecting with minority professional organizations, minority serving institutions on a regular basis? Also, and you know, through interaction with them, changing people's mindset about what merit means because people can bring in very diverse viewpoints to strengthen a team, to strengthen a study design, to strengthen community outreach efforts. These are all merits. You know, they might be viewed differently depending on the viewer's perspective. And so I think these are the work that need to be done on a regular basis. Unfortunately, you know, these activities take time and take, take you know, resource 
And oftentimes we are just so, you know, so busy with our day day to day work. These things don't necessarily occupy our mind all the time, but I think they should be. <laughs> and we should take the time, take the effort to build this sort of the long-term solution for diversity. Yeah, I'd love to build on, on what Jing was saying, particularly around how we think about merit. Um, because as we touched on previously, data science is often done in these complex teams where the needs and the, you know, the, what might be considered as the merits of the different individuals is quite different across the teams. And so when we think about diversity, I think in data science, we think about it along a, a lot of different axes. And so we, we were thinking about the diversity in terms of you know, the, the different backgrounds and experiences that people are bringing, but also in terms of the diversity in the areas of disciplinary methodological expertise. Are they bringing quantitative or qualitative kinds of data science experience? And so I think it, it just, as Jing saying, because there is this complexity and I think there's an increasing appreciation in academia of the values of producing um, products that are sort of different from the traditional products. Um, so, you know, things like <laughs> creating open source software, <laughs> for instance, um, and, you know, it, it used to be challenging, I think, and, and I'm sure still is in, in many places, but I've seen this transforming, at least in some departments across the UW campus for somebody who was really spending a lot of time um, developing data science methodologies for a particular field, say biology, to be seen as a real biologist. Um, and I think, you know, just, and to be hired by a biology department because they were devoting so much time to the methodology development. And I think, again, this, this gets into thinking about diversity, just a, a real broadening our understanding of, of what it means to be doing this type of research um, and how, what are the metrics that we're looking for. And I think also community engaged research has become much more valued um, in the university environment. And again, just like we were talking about in the last questions, the skills that it takes to do community engaged research can be quite different from what we think of, you know, in, as sort of ivory tower researchers. And I know it used to it, it used to drive me crazy a little bit when people would talk about what you need to be a traditional scientist, because I think going back to another one of your points, Rick, is that the communication piece is, is has and always has been super important because the work you do is not important unless you can convey it right, unless you're putting it out into the public and, and ideally in a, a wide variety of forms and engaging with a wide variety of stakeholders. And so those are all things that I think need to be valued more in the um, review process. And just to, to go back to, you know, I, I think it's really important to build in kind of standardized guidelines if we're really trying to increase diversity. And so that means integrating the diversity considerations into every aspect of the hiring process. Um, and Jing talked, touched on a lot of these. So, um, you know, about where are you, where are you extending the word out? Which organizations are you engaging with to, to um, help publicize your position? I think there's also ways you can telegraph that in your position description itself. So putting things, different states have different, you know, regulations about the hiring process, but we can all put statements within our, um, you know, our position descriptions about, you know, that we're looking for candidates who are committed to working with diverse student and community populations, and that we're, you know, we're encouraging particular individuals to apply. So making sure to include that kind of language. Also, you know, referencing your organization's diversity statement, and this can be at the level of your entire university, but also ideally for your particular organization. That shows to candidates that this is something you're really considering, you know, you consider important, and you've taken the time to develop and ideally to be enforcing, you know, and, and, and have metrics around um, diversity for your group. Those indicate to people who might be applying about the type of environment you're creating. Because as we know, it's not enough just to do hiring, we're looking at retention. So we need to really be attentive to the importance of building a welcoming and supporting environment for people coming into our groups. This really includes being mindful of the disproportionate burden that's often placed on key individuals from groups who are historically underrepresented in data science, that they may be called on to be, you know, to, to participate in a lot more activities. And so being mindful of that is really also important with the hopes of being able to retain and, and create that positive environment. Go ahead, Rick, I'm sorry. No, I just wanted to say, I think one of the, the hopes I have for your field is the very diversity of data science. 
I'm hopeful that by virtue of the fact that you reach across more disciplines than is usual the, the case. We know, for example, we see better representation in the diversity in fields like the social sciences and the like. And so by finding a way to bring them into the data science world, I think you have a chance to build on that. And I hope that when we have a conversation five years from now, we'll be talking about a very different and changed group of people. Sarah, you get last word. <laughs> well, I thought actually you had such a nice last word. I was gonna, gonna say I didn't need a last word, but I just would reiterate your point. I think there's a real opportunity to draw in students who might not otherwise have been interested in data science into data science by displaying the types of issues that you can work on using data science as, you know, as, as the tools that you use. The program that Jing mentioned, and we also run this data science for social good program I mentioned, and there's huge interest in these types of programs from students coming from all different disciplinary backgrounds um, because they're, in, they're driven by the questions. They're driven less by the methodology, but the methodology allows them to answer these super compelling questions. And we have a data science minor that just rolled out at the University of Washington last fall that's really built around trying to draw students outside of STEM into data science. Um, not, to, not to become data scientists necessarily or get hired as data scientists, but to be in these intermediary positions, which are going to be so critical for people who understand enough about data science to you know, be the go um, in organizations to, to be able to have the reflective and kind of um, qualitative understanding of how data science can be used to tackle problems and also be really aware of the pitfalls of using data science and to have that kind of knowledge base and be in that, kind of, again, that translator role. I think that's gonna be critical and, and that type of program is really gonna change what data science looks like across organizations. I think as long as it's in your, your hand, you and the two of you, I'm okay, I'll be all right. I just hope that 10 years from now, I don't do what I did when I was a young department chair many years ago and wanted very much to change diversity. I went out and I was told, start a pipeline with elementary school students and I said but they're only eight and nine years old so I won't see them long enough they said but you'll get a really smart one and you can hire them at age 12 and so I'm half hope that the diversity of your discipline and commitment from people like you will, will help us overcome what is all too often a, a, a major challenge for us on behalf of all of us at Harris, I want to thank you very, very much for your time and, and very much for what the work you're doing. Just keep on going. Take care. Thank you, thank you thank so you. much. Thank you for listening to Innovators, a production of Harris Search Associates. We'll have more insightful conversations with global thought leaders to follow.